Now let's take a second and welcome Jesus into this place today. Come on. We are essential. We are the church. No one can do what the church can do. Businesses can provide goods, but they can't provide the good news. Schools can educate you, but they can't make you wise. Governments can legislate, but they can't change your heart. Your family can love you, but they can't save your soul. But the church, but the church takes hurting men and women and introduces them to Jesus. No one can do what the church can do. The church is essential because Jesus Christ of Nazareth is essential to life. And people say the church is shrinking. Lie. Lie from the pit of hell. Lie. Did you know that since 1910, the church, people around the world, Big C Church, has quadrupled in size. In 1910, there were over 600,000 worldwide believers professing some faith in Jesus Christ. Today, over 100 years later, there are 2.3 billion people on the planet that profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is not a decline. <laughs> and when something is got the quarter of the world in agreement, I say that it's essential. I say that it's essential. Because what is essential? Essential is a need, not a want. <laughs> essential is a need, not a want. I learned during this time there are some things I can live without. I can live without a haircut for a little while. Oh, it felt good, though. It felt good. I can live without certain stores. Amen. Rough. <laughs> you know what I can't live without? I can't live without Jesus. No, say it again. What, what, what can you not live without? Jesus! Because those same stores I can't even walk into without him. It's Pentecost Sunday. Y'all get, get, get fired up. <laughs> but I've learned what I can and cannot live without. And I think so many people during this time have realized that faith is essential. That what it is that, that God has called them to is essential in their life. And online is good for a time, but this is where it's at. And I pray for the day that all of our brothers and sisters are back with us. Amen? Amen? But here's what we've got to understand. There's a lot of people hurting in this world right now. There's a lot of people that are in pain right now. That are missing this essential. They're lashing out because they're searching for something like this. And what I want to talk about in this series, Essential, is that what connects our faith is greater than what divides our feelings. Because in the middle of all this crisis, in the middle of all this pain, there's a lot of feels, aren't there? There's a lot of emotions. There, the emotional level was high before the world broke out in chaos. That just stoked the flames. But we can let our emotions divide us in the moment. Or we can cut through the emotions. We can cut through the feelings. We can cut through those things that are temporary. And we can drive ourselves towards the faith of God that connects us. And the reason the faith of God connects us is because there is one that we look to in time of trouble. There is one that we look to in time of trouble. Not many that we look to in time of trouble. There is one that we look to in time of trouble. His name is Jesus. Because if you look to the governor, he will fail you. If you look to the president, he will fail you. Is everyone equally offended right now? 
good. Because what connects us is deeper than a feeling. What connects us is deeper than a... Can I just take my time this morning? There is something greater. Because in time of trouble, I don't look to the government. In time of trouble, I don't just look to my neighbor. I don't look to my family. I don't look to my friends. In time of trouble, I hit my knees. I get at an altar wherever I am, and I look to Jesus. Because no one else is going to help me through this trouble but him. That's why in Hebrews chapter 4 it says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, that great high priest is Jesus. And you know why he's the great high priest? He's the only high priest that qualified as a king, a priest, and a sacrifice. There's not another king or priest that was willing to lay their life down on the altar that they made atonement for and give their life. It was always the life of an animal. There was no other priest qualified to give that sacrifice. So he's a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, we all hold firmly to a faith that we profess. But is it the faith in Jesus, the Son of God? Or are we filtering that faith through our emotions of the moment. I sorry, you don't have to help me preach right there. It's good. Because what happens is when you're under pressure, people will figure out your faith. When you are under pressure, when you are pressed, people will see what comes out and what you profess, and what you profess is what you really have faith in. See, our profession is essential in our trial. When we get pressed by the, the things and the circumstances of the world, when we're pressed by the troubles, we are going to utter some kind of faith. It might be our frustration, but frustration being shared is just faith in yourself. Your frustration is in your lack of abilities because you have no control over the moment. But if you move that faith from yourself to God, then... It doesn't matter if you're able to do anything in the moment or not. Hey, I profess faith in God. Because it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. You know he knows you. No, I mean, like, he really knows you. You know the stuff that you've never shared with anybody in your entire life in the world? Nobody that you trust enough? No. He knows that. And he still loves you. <laughs> but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There are some words in there that are really, 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 really important. That this is not just a personal journey. Let us, so we, find great to help, grace to help us in our time of need. That's not a me going to God's throne by myself. That's me linking arms with you going to God's throne. Because if in the middle of all the fields, we're putting our faces down before God, approaching Him, then I know we're not going to have face-offs. Come on, somebody. Because the confidence we have and I, I've, I've long wondered this. You read this verse and you go, let us approach God's grace with confidence. And I think the first thing that comes to my mind, maybe it's the same thing that comes to your mind, is, is, oh man, I have confidence to come before God's throne. And that confidence is ego. Oh man, I can, I can do it. That's not what the confidence is that we're talking about, though. The confidence, my confidence, is in His throne, not our agenda. The confidence I have walking into the throne room of God is not that I belong there. 
It's that he belongs there. And he's not moving. And he said, come in. That's the confidence I have. It's not in my agenda. It's not in what I can do. But this is a journey that we have to take together. So over the next few weeks, I want to take this journey in faith and I want to get back to some basics. I want to get back to some basics of our faith, some essentials of our faith. Because there are some things that you just have to believe if you're going to be a Jesus follower. There's just some stuff we have to agree on, right? Because if you don't agree on some of these things, you're you're just not a Jesus follower. You can call yourself whatever you want to. Pink can call itself blue, but that doesn't make it blue. All right, then. We're just trying to break this down. (laughs) Because there's some essential beliefs, and then there are some non-essential beliefs, right? Because if there's essential, and and this has been the problem with of late, right? When you deem certain things essential, that means some things are non-essential, and you go, says who? Am I meddling? Cool. I'm just going to keep waiting in. It's all right. So that means there are some essential beliefs, and if there are some essential beliefs, then there are some non-essential beliefs that really don't matter whether you believe right or wrong, right? That all come out in the wash. You can ask him when we get there, as long as you believe in the essentials. The essentials are really important. It's kind of like the difference between state borders and national borders. If you cross state border, you're still in America, right? Right? There might be different laws in each state. It might feel totally different, but you're still in America. Some of beliefs, if you cross those beliefs, then guess what? You're still a child of God. You're still in the kingdom of God. But then there are some essential truths. There are some essential beliefs that if you cross that, that's like crossing a national border. You're no longer, you're in Mexico or Canada, right? You're no longer in the kingdom of God. Now you're you're somewhere else. So we're going to talk about these essentials. We're talking about these lines that we have to agree on. Talk about these things that can bring us together in faith. Because if anything, we need unity right now. St. Augustine of Hippo said it this way. St. Augustine of Hippo was a man that lived in the 4th and 5th centuries. And If you think the things that we talk about on Sunday morning are new concepts, I just have (laughs) news for you. Um, Pastor's not that brilliant. And there is nothing that the church hasn't discussed in 2,000 years. None of it's new. Might be new to us. None of it's new. So when people come out and they have questions of their faith, I guarantee you those questions have been answered for hundreds of years. Just go read something. But he said it this way concerning faith and the essential beliefs. In essential beliefs, we have unity. We come together in our essential beliefs. Because in Ephesians 4 and 4, if you remember this, in our All for One series, we covered this. You guys remember All for One series? That was like forever ago, like (laughs) pre-quarantine. Anybody remember what life was like before the quarantine? That that series. (laughs) There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's just one body of Christ. There's just one big C church worldwide. You are either in the body or you are not in the body. You believe the essential truths or you don't. I can't make it any more simple. Right? I also can't make it easy. Mm. I didn't say it was easy, but it's simple. Because the essentials define your faith. The essentials define what it is that separates you from others that don't believe those things. It's the essentials that you say, okay, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in this. And look, over the course of this series, we're going to cover four essentials that are massive. We're not going to cover any of them today. 
Today is an introduction. Did you guys know that when I write a sermon, it's usually like a three or four hour sermon? I just cut it up for like a month and a half so you guys don't have to sit here for three hours. (laughs) Amen, Pastor. Give us the intro today. (laughs) Because the essentials define your faith. You can't have faith without saying, okay, this is what I believe. This is what I don't believe. But then there are some things that are non-essential. There's some things that just that don't matter. Like if no one's ever asked you the question, maybe this will mess you up for the rest of the day. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? I might mess you up for the rest of the day. Here's the thing. That doesn't matter. It is a completely non-essential belief whether you fall down in the belly button camp or the non-belly button camp. It just doesn't matter, does it? You can believe whatever you want. You have the right to be wrong. I've missed you guys. But he said this concerning the non-essential beliefs. In non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. We have freedom. You can have your camp over here. You can have your camp over here. We can come still here and worship together because there are some essentials in the middle of the target that we aim for. And we believe in those essentials. And those essentials unite us in worship. And you have freedom for these other things, these non-essentials. Believe what you want. It's not going to change whether or not you make it into heaven. Guess what? When you get to heaven, you go ask them. Just try to not make it awkward, right? I don't know how many people are going to walk up to them and, and be like, so. <laughs> just curious. You don't have to show me. Just let me know. Here's the thing. Sometimes we confuse unity for uniformity. Unity does not require uniformity. We're not all going to look the same. We're not going to all sound the same. We're not going to all believe 100% of the same thing. Let me just tell you something, and this is just, mm, I'm going to open this up and let this go. You can't get every pastor in a denomination to agree on 100% of everything. I hope that doesn't come to a shock, as a shock to anybody. That's why we meet every two years and discuss things, guys. <laughs> if that's not going to happen with people that spend all the time studying and reading books, not just scripture, but extra scriptural things, then guess what? Everyone in a church is not going to agree on everything. Everyone's not going to look the same. Everyone's not going to sound the same because there is some diversity in the church. Amen. Because that's what God created, diversity. And if you're not finding it in the church, then there's something wrong with the church. I'll just keep dropping truths. It's okay. I know you guys are easing back into this. (laughs) I've been up here preaching for weeks. (laughs) Unity does not require uniformity. Paul kind of puts it this way to the Roman church. In Romans chapter 14, he says this, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. If someone doesn't believe all the same thing, as long as they've got the essentials down and they don't have all these these things around, is it our job to beat them over the head until they agree with us? That's a good way to divide the church. Because in verse 2 he says, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Isn't that great news? Look at me, right? Vegans. (laughs) Vegans. <laughs> Jesus loves you too. Isn't that great? You just don't have to tell everybody. <laughs> Public surface announcement. Here's the thing about this, though. 
Is he talking about modern culture? Absolutely not. <laughs> it feels like it almost, though, doesn't it? <laughs> He's talking about some pretty serious religious things having to do with Jews and Gentiles and different beliefs coming into Christianity. Even Jews today, there's, they won't eat pork. Right? So that's one of the things he's talking about right here. So he continues in verse 3. He says, The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. Look, just because you have more convictions about your faith, you don't look at somebody else and go, You're not a Jesus follower. How dare you? Who do you think you are? Don't look at contempt with anyone. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. Vegans, that's for you too. For God has accepted them, all of them. Who are you to, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. We serve each other because God is our master, not because we are each other's masters. And they will stand. And oh, you got to get this. And they will stand. Let me, let me try this again. They will stand. For the Lord is able to make them stand. Stop trying to prop other people up with your faith. You're hurting them sometimes. You're breaking them down because they're not there yet. You might be there, and they might be on their way there, but they're not there yet, and you can kill somebody by dragging them behind you. Let them take the journey. Guess what? They might end up in the exact same place you are now. Wouldn't it be a travesty if you were still there? Move with your own faith, church. Because here's the final part. In all our beliefs, the ones we agree with and the ones we don't agree with, we show love. We love one another. It doesn't matter if I think you're right or wrong. These non-essential beliefs, who cares? Let's stop arguing over the little things that don't matter because there are some important topics we need to discuss as a church. And we don't have time because we're in the weeds over here with this non-essential nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because the same person Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. This is the ultimate hypothetical. If, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I could see everything that's coming and I could warn you. If I could fathom everything, if I could understand everything in the universe. You can't and you can't. That's a hypothetical. But even if you could, even if you thought you are the smartest person on the face of of God's green planet. And you let everyone know. If you don't love anybody. You are nothing. Because we all have this disease. Not coronavirus. We have this disease where we all think we know more than we do. Oh, you don't have to, don't worry, I'm not a medical professional and I can't personally diagnose you today of that, but uh, just trust me. I believe every human being on the face of the planet has a disease that we all think we know more than we do. Because always what changes knowledge is perspective. You can think you know another person, but until you've walked in their shoes and experienced their life and experienced where they are, you don't know. Because love is not a belief. Love is a relationship. 
It's not something you believe. It's something you do. It's a knowledge of who Jesus is. It's not a dictate of faith. It is saying, Jesus, I want to get to know you more. And in that experience of knowing you more, that will change the perspective of what I thought I knew. If you want to find out what's going on in the world today, find out from somebody that feels differently than you do. Form a relationship with that person and have a conversation. And love them. Don't say, oh, I love them, but... That's a belief. I love them. No conditions. Because here's the hard part. Here's the hard part. Imagine what Jesus did for us in forgiving us. That was relational. And now ask yourself, am I capable of forgiving anyone like that? And when I say anyone, I just don't mean like the nicest person you know. Oh, of course I can forgive them. No, I want you to think of the worst person that you can think of. The person that if you said their name, everyone would revile them. Can you forgive them? Can you love them? Let's make it a little bit more personal because that's way out there, isn't it? Everybody's like <gasps> taking a deep breath right now. So let's bring it back. What about just that person that is getting on your nerves right now? Love is a relationship. Forgive those closest to you. And you're going to be able to learn how to forgive those far away. Because this is essential. Love is essential. People are hurting in the world today and taking advantage of these situations because they're missing that relationship. 2 Peter 1 and 3. His divine power. Who's Jesus? His divine power has given us everything we need. Stop saying you don't have what you need to live a godly life. He says you do. There are no excuses when he says, no, 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 no. I've already given you everything you need. No excuses. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. How do I learn to love? I have a relationship with the one who is love itself. And if I can learn, it's not that you really so much learn to love Jesus. It's that you learn, because Jesus is easy to love. He's perfect. But it's, it's that you learn the other side of the relationship. It's that you learn how much he loves you. That knowledge changes everything. Because if you, if you can learn how Jesus loves you, maybe you can turn that around and love someone else the way Jesus loves you. Because Jesus is essential to life. Jesus is essential. Not just eternal life. Life here. Eternity begins by knowing Him. Would you bow your heads today? If you're in here or you're online and you don't know Jesus, let me just share this with you right now. Jesus is essential to life. He offers eternal life for you. And as we get to the essentials and we get into those things, I want you to see how life-changing it can be. And I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with the world that we're living in. That we would get through this pain and that we would be brighter on the other side.
But this wouldn't be for naught, but people would form relationships. Begin to love. Would you pray with me today in your own words? Father God, because you are essential, because we need you for life itself, God, we need your peace in our life. God, the, the things that we need are laid out before us. God, you have given us everything we need to glorify you. God, I pray that what you have made essential, the church to the world, that we would be that light, we would be that hope, we would be what you've called us to be to share that with others. We give you the praise in Jesus' name.